In the last part, we have seen or we have got introduced to creep terminology and here in this part, we will be looking at what are the different deformation mechanisms which operate or which causes creep in a material. And those deformation mechanisms occurs at high temperature. So before going into that, let's understand what happens at low temperatures or at room temperature. So in normal plastic deformation, we get this typical stress strain curve and you can see that when I want to impose this much plastic deformation, I need to apply this much stress. And when I want to impose this much plastic strain, I need to increase a stress and we can get this understanding using this stress strain curve. While in case of high temperatures, we keep stress constant as well as temperature constant. So we keep it material at high temperature. So we have defined a high temperature as to be T greater than or equal to 0.4 Tm. And during creep, we get this creep curve. We have got introduced to this curve and we can see that the plastic deformation increases with increasing time. So there are three major creep mechanisms. One is dislocation based mechanism, another is diffusion based mechanism and third one is grain boundary sliding which is a combination of this diffusion and dislocation based mechanisms. So these dislocation based mechanisms are majorly cross slip of dislocations and a climb of dislocations and we have a diffusion based mechanisms and we have grain boundary sliding. So let's understand each mechanisms now in more detail. So let's first consider diffusion based mechanism that is a diffusion creep. Now we know that we have polycrystalline material which contains grains. So I have marked a grain over here and these are grain boundaries. So let's consider this material is subjected to high temperature and temperature is constant and the stress also we keep it constant. And let's consider it has a grain size D. Now when I deform my material, so some of the grain boundaries will experience a tensile stress. So this grain boundaries are experiencing a tensile stress while some grain boundaries will experience a compressive stress. And when we know that a boundaries or a material when they are experiencing a tensile stress, there will be increasing the vacancy concentration. We have dealt this with when we saw climb mechanism and we have dealt with a relation where the increase in stress will lead to increase in the vacancy concentration. So when we have a tensile stress, we see an increase in the vacancy concentration. And here in this region, which are experiencing a less tensile stress or a compressive stress, there will not be much vacancy concentration as compared to these regions. And that is why there will be a difference in vacancy concentration. And we are dealing this case at high temperatures. So because of this differential vacancy concentration or a gradient in vacancy concentration, these vacancies will start diffusing to these regions. So these vacancies gets diffused to these regions. In other words, we can say that there will be a mass flow from this region to these regions. So these are the regions which are experiencing the less tensile stress as compared to these regions. So we have mass flow from this region to this region in this fashion. So you have this mass flow or a vacancy flow through lattice. That is, this is a lattice or I can say that this is a grain or from inside grain it is happening. This diffusion is occurring through lattice. So this vacancy can diffuse to these regions through grain boundaries also in this way. So we have this vacancy concentration which is here and they start diffusing to these regions through grain boundaries. So there are two pathways for this vacancy diffusion. One is through lattice and one is through grain boundary. And because of this diffusion, there will be a change in shape and this shape change will be in this way. Now, based on which are the paths which are taken for this diffusion to occur, this diffusion mechanisms or diffusion creep mechanisms will be named. So if it is through a grain boundary, we call it as a cobalt creep. And if it is through lattice or through grain, it is called as a Navarro wearing creep. So you have diffusion through grain boundaries, we call it as a cobalt creep. If you have a diffusion through lattice, we call it as a Navarro wearing creep. And why this diffusion occurs? Because we are subjecting material to a high temperature. And how you will remember this? So you have a grain boundary, so grain boundary which is close to C. So if I take alphabets here, so when I see grain boundary, C is close to G, so I remember this as a cobalt creep. And when I see a lattice diffusion, I have Navarro-Herring creep. So L is close to N. So I remember in this way. 
that when I talk about grain boundary diffusion, it is a cobalt creep. When I think of lattice diffusion, I consider it as a Nabarberry creep. So this is the way which I remember the names of this creep diffusion mechanism. Now let's look at another creep mechanism. Let's look at grain boundary sliding. So this grain boundary sliding usually does not play an important role during primary or a secondary creep or that is stage 1 or stage 2 creep. It plays an important role in stage 3 creep or a tertiary creep and it becomes an important mechanism, deformation mechanism when we think of a superplasticity in materials. We will be dealing superplasticity in our subsequent lectures. So grain boundary sliding plays an important role in superplasticity. Now let's look at how grain boundary sliding occurs. So here there are four grains which are subjected to a tensile stress at sufficient high temperature and it has sufficient grain size and grain volume and you can see that these arrows which are marked which indicates there will be a sliding of these grain boundaries over each other or these grains can slide along this way on each other and because of that there will be a shape change which is being occurring here and this shape change will lead to a final shape change in this fashion or the strain of this being accumulated in this way. Grain boundary sliding occurs by sliding of boundaries over each other. However, in grain boundary sliding both mechanisms participate. Let me write that down. So in grain boundary sliding you have dislocations participating plus diffusion. Also you can say that when this sliding occurs over each other, there will be a compatibility which is being maintained through diffusion. I am not going into details of it. So let me just mark it over here. So you have a diffusion which occurs through grain to assist this grain boundary sliding. And that is how the compatibility between grains is being maintained. So here you can see that you have a grain boundary sliding which is occurring and it is occurring on particular grain boundaries. You can see it, it is occurring on this boundary, on this boundary, on this boundary and on this boundary, not on this boundary. However, the shape change is associated here and you can see that it starts sliding and the shape change will occur in this fashion. So grains start deforming in this way and now you get the final shape change in this way. So we have diffusion assistance so as to maintain a compatibility between two grains. Now let's move on and see other deformation mechanisms which are operating at high temperatures. Now let's look at a dislocation based mechanisms that is a cross slip of a screw dislocation. We have got introduced to what is cross slip. In this case let's say this is our slip plane and let's say this is a screw dislocation. So what is a screw dislocation? You have tangent vector parallel to virtuous one and let's say there is an obstacle or a precipitate on this slip plane and when this screw dislocation glides on this slip plane it faces this obstacle and thus it glides and comes over here and as you know that screw dislocation can cross slip or it can move on another slip plane. Why? Because the tangent vector is parallel to the Burgess vector. So it, it sees this obstacle and then under the influence of the stress it changes its direction and it can cross slip or it can move on another slip plane and that is how the cross slip of screw dislocation happens and this becomes very easy at high temperatures. So we have cross slip occurring at high temperatures easily and thus cross slip plays an important role during creep deformation. Also climb of an edge dislocation plays an important role during creep. We have got introduced what is climb and here I have marked certain slip planes and I see here an obstacle or a precipitate and this is an edge dislocation. As you know that edge dislocation cannot cross slip, it can climb only. So when we, this edge dislocation want to move further when it reaches at this stage it has to climb and how climb occurs let's understand that let's consider this is a slip plane and let's consider this is an edge dislocation how edge dislocation is defined you have a tangent vector perpendicular to its virtuous vector and this is a half plane which I have marked and you can see there is an obstacle on this slip plane and let's consider this edge dislocation glides on this slip plane and it sees this obstacle and now it cannot it cannot move further. So what happens? There will be a climb of this edge dislocation. And how does climb occur? So let's consider this climb will occur in this way where the atom diffuses. And let's understand this diffusion of atoms in this fashion. 
So let's say you have an HS location and you have vacancies which are being created because we are subjecting the material to a high temperature and there will be always an equilibrium concentration of vacancies and because of that diffusion will take place. So you have this diffusion of atoms from this core to this place and you can see that this dislocation climbs up. and because of this climb process which occurs here this dislocation will move in this fashion and then it can come to some other slip plane and it can move under the influence of stress. So this is what is being a climb of an H dislocation which leads to a creep deformation of a material. So we have a glide of this dislocation and it can climb up and can move on another slip plane where these obstacles are not present. And that is how these mechanisms operate. Now let's understand dislocation creep or let's try to find out what is an effect of temperature, stress, etc. So let's consider this is a slip plane. Let's consider this is a barrier. So this barrier can be precipitated or locks such as long metal quarter locks etc. And let's consider there is a dislocation source over here and it generates a dislocations. I mark an H dislocations over here. Now these dislocations will see this barrier and they cannot move further on this slip plane one. They have to climb up or if there is a screw dislocation they have to cross. So let's consider an H dislocation which sees these barriers and let the length of this dislocation source from the barrier be L. So this dislocation has to glide this length of L. Let's consider there is another slip plane which is at a distance of H from this slip plane 1. Let me call that as a slip plane 2. So this H is called as a climb distance whereas this L is called as a glide length. And if this dislocation wants to move, it has to climb up on this slip plane and then it can move. Why this climb up can occur because we are applying a stress, a constant stress and we are also providing a material with a constant high temperature. So under the influence of temperature and stress, this dislocation can climb up. Now let's look at what is a total creep strain that is delta gamma due to glide and climb and I can write that as delta gamma is equal to delta glide plus delta gamma climb. As you can see that this h is much much smaller than this l that is glide length the climb distance is much much smaller than the glide length and thus i can write that delta gamma climb is much much smaller than delta gamma glide so what is a strain developed because of climb is much smaller than because of the glide and i can write this this relation from this relation is delta gamma is, is equal to or more or less equal to delta gamma glide now let's see what is the time taken for a glide and climb step. So here there is a mistake, spelling mistake. So let me correct. So this is a step and you can see that t equal to t glide plus t climb. That is time required for glide and time required for climb. That is a time for this dislocation to move on this slip plane one and time required to climb on this another slip plane. So T glide is much much smaller than T climb because it is easier to move on this slip plane. So it requires a less time from this source to this barrier. But as a climb is a diffusion process and thus it will take more time. So we can write that T glide is much much smaller than T climb and thus we can say that total time taken can be equal to time which is required for climb. And this can be written as T is equal to H upon Vc where Vc is nothing but the climb velocity of dislocations. So we have certain climb velocity of these dislocations and based on this distance which has to be dislocation has to overcome you can find out what is the time required for dislocations to climb up. So it can be given as T equal to H upon Vc. Now shear strain rate because we are talking about creep deformation we have talked about strain rate. So shear strain rate can be written as delta gamma upon delta t that is total shear strain developed divided by the total time required and we have seen this relation gamma is equal to rho into v into l where rho is a dislocation density Birch's vector and l is the length average length a dislocation moves so we can use this relation and we can find out a strain rate we use this relation that is we put rho bl here and what is the time required h upon vc and then you get this relation that strain rate is equal to rho bl upon h into vc where vc is the climb velocity of dislocations. 
Now let's probe further. So this we see that is climb velocity of dislocation can be written as delta CV exponential of minus QM upon KT. And this CV can be written as initial concentration of vacancies can be written as exponential of minus QV upon KT. So here this VC that is climb velocity of dislocation depends on the vacancy concentration and QM activation energy for migration of vacancies. And this CV star that is initial vacancy concentration can be written as exponential of minus QV upon KT where QV is nothing but enthalpy for creation of vacancy. And you can write this delta CV in terms of a stress applied and a temperature. So we can write this delta CV using CV naught as CV naught e to the power sigma omega upon kt minus e to the power minus sigma omega upon kt. So as we are dealing with a concentration gradient of vacancies, so this is because of the tensile nature of the stress and this is because of the compressive nature of the stress. That is how we get this vacancy gradient that is delta C difference in the vacancy concentrations and where sigma is applied stress and omega is activation volume and as we know that this sigma omega will be much much smaller so this sigma omega is much much smaller than kt so this is not, nothing but an energy a stress energy and this is a thermal energy so during creep deformation we don't have stress energy to be much higher than the thermal energy and thus we can safely assume that sigma omega is much much smaller than kt and we can reduce down this relation to this form where the vacancy concentration or difference in the vacancy concentration can be written as cv naught into 2 sigma omega upon kt and we use this relation we have derived this relation in earlier slide and we replace this vc using these relations which we have got and you get this relation and as we know that sigma is proportional to dislocation density square root of this dislocation density we have seen this using a taylor hardening relation in our previous slide when we discussed about strain hardening in materials so we can write that sigma that applied stress is proportional to square root of dislocation density and thus we can find out the dislocation density is proportional to sigma square and when you put this in this relation what we get is this format where we have used this delta cv and this rho is replaced by sigma square here and there are certain constants c1 and c2 and we can write this relation in this way now when you modify this relation you consider this sigma square and you multiply it with sigma so we get sigma cube here and when we put this cv naught also in this relation we can use combine this exponential of minus qv upon kt with exponential of minus qm upon kt where qm is nothing but an activation energy for migration of vacancies and qv is enthalpy for creation of vacancies and we can write a total q as this so we can write this qm and qv in terms of q which is nothing but activation energy for creep and we can reduce down this constants to c and other constants such as v l and h into one constant as c and we can put this sigma cube here now we can know that this is a shear strain and we can convert it into a normal strain in this way by changing some constants from c now we change it to a here and we can get this relation in terms of sigma and activation energy for the creep so we can find out a relation of strain rate with respect to applied stress and temperature and this relation is called as a natural creep law or 3 power law creep in this relation you can see that this 3 is nothing but a stress exponent let me write that down so here this 3 is stress exponent in earlier lecture we have mentioned that this kind of relation is empirical so we tried to find out what is the physics of it so we can say that strain rate is proportional to sigma to the power n exponential of minus q upon kt so we have related strain rate with stress and strain rate with respect to temperature so here n is equal to 3 and this kind of model is called as natural creep law in so this is not the only one relation which you find it in a creep literature so this n can take values from around 3 to 5 and based on this 
relation or where the n takes values of 3 to 5 based on the stress state and temperature these values will indicate what are the deformation mechanisms which are operating and we will be looking at that or we will get introduced briefly introduced to what what is the significance of stress exponent and with this i will stop here